distinguished delegates of the forum. For me, this is a, an honor to participate as moderator. We are in session three, top seven reforms for the next seven years. I enjoy to invite speakers, Serik Jumangarin, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Trade and Integration. Reinbek Patalov, Chairman of the National Entrepreneurship Chamber, Atamikian. Kairat Mojibayev, Entrepreneur, Head of RG Brands. Ashat Uzbekov, the Chairman of KSL Management Board. Mr. James Robinson, British economist, co-author of the book Why Nations Fail. Oljas Toliulov, the Deputy Chairman of the Agency for Strategic uh, uh, Planning, and uh, Oljas Khudebergenov, the Senior Partner of the Center for Strategic Initiatives. Friends, we'll try during one hour, 20 minutes, and at 15.50 we are going to finish this session. So top seven reforms for the next seven years will be the topic of our session and our business circulation, especially in the government. Uh, the prioritization always misinterpreted. A priority is everywhere, and maybe prioritization is just uh, refusal from something that you are not able to perform, and that's why in the name of our session, the message is incorporated on necessity of prioritization, and top seven means we need to choose the priority seven, and seven probably is too many, whether we will be in now, or we will be having sufficient budget funds for such top seven reforms for the next seven years. Understanding that after the election of the head of the state, as well as after the uh, election into the parliament, we are uh, opening the new political cycle. We presume that we will get the new combination of policy makers and uh, composition of the government will be uh, renewed. Um, and with these political institutions and the new configuration, the reforms will be implemented. So what are these reforms or could be these reforms? And we will ask this question to each speaker. And first of all, I'd like to give the opportunity to give the floor to entrepreneurship representatives in order to give them uh, to to give them opportunity to speak first, not to listen to the representatives of the government. And that's why the floor is given to Mr. Kairat Mojibayev, entrepreneur and citizen, who what should become priorities. Good afternoon, colleagues. Thanks a lot to organizers of this important forum, especially at this stage of the Kazakhstani statehood development. and. Uh, for the opportunity to share the views and I am as entrepreneur like to say that for me one of the key priorities will be development of micro competition or competitiveness and this is actually the solution for all the structural problems at the internal, global, regional levels. And for Kazakhstani entrepreneurs, there is quite a serious challenge as domination of the public sector in the economy, domination of the monopoly monopolists or big players and always there is a choice always there is alternative to choose the quiet for the existence and to sacrifice for the long-term sustainable development or to build so-called micro competitiveness competitive environment where the new talents and new ideas may appear and social economic development of the country could get in such environment uh, more sustainability. And where it is possible to do in all the sectors of economy, in all the regions, because the level of so-called micro-competitiveness allows to achieve those uh, tasks 
that are set up to many enterprises and specific sectors as well as to the government. For me, this is the key. And from the very beginning of the year, it was much discussed by the head of the state as well as by the government. Karike thanks a lot. It is obvious to have competition rather than to have no competition. What mechanisms, apart to rhetorics, multiply repeated, we may see it. Yes, you may ask about the case, and I did assessment of the previous session, and I wanted to make some sequence in uh, from session to session and that's why uh, we wanted also to use the competence of Mr. Taleb and uh, be faced on his black swans and now in this exact environment of huge and maybe in fair volatility his theory of anti-fragility obtains key importance and it would be better to uh, disclose this topic and one of the speakers Ibek Borisov uh, the head of uh, defense and military enterprise uh, uh, showed that there is domination of the Russian industry in defense and uh, manufacturing a domination of the public state in uh, production of defensive uh, equipment. And there is the dilemma what to choose, to develop our own defense industry or to prefer more governmental or private. Uh, and uh, if we look at this from the perspective of anti-fragility or sustainable development, we need to take huge uh, strategic decisions that cannot be solved between the enterprise that is headed by IBEC and this would be the high-level state decisions that could ensure sustainability of all post-Soviet space and its defense capacity that raises the funds and attracts competence as well as solves the key issues of uh, national security. And what are the mechanisms? Mechanisms are obvious. For that, we need a political will, and if you'd like, I may talk more about that. For example, if we take some certain case, we have anti-monopoly legislation, there is specific authority that operates inside our state. At the same time, Kazakhstan is a member of the Eurasian Economic Union, and the dominating players like Russian ones or Belarusian ones, they are not exposed to this legislation and they use the monopolistic position. And then we fight against the consequences and talk about the inflation, May we speak about the obsolete technologies, we talk about lack of technologies and lack of local strong manufacturers, but this is already fighting the consequences and that's why we need to defend uh, our national players and uh, establish some common legislation in the Eurasian Economic Union and the competition development should become one of our national priorities and we need to restart everything with the human capital and there will be uh, industries open for funding and uh, ecosystems would become more sustainable. There are very many examples for that uh, during our 30-year experience and we need to take such cases as the basis. I just expect that we would uh, talk more about institutions and about counterbalancing mechanisms or maybe people affiliated with the management board and you as entrepreneur could get no full picture and uh, 
Look, today we are talking about the national scale scale of the forum. It is not devoted to corporate governance issues. Corporate governance is the same adjustable. Yeah, we need some analogies in order to talk about government authorities more. What we see like in corporate governance or in uh, individual corporate technologies, we are both talented and effective, and uh, we spend a lot of money. One of the biggest budgets are spent on education. One of the biggest budgets are spent on uh, health care, and we educate it and continue to educate our best talents overseas, but when they come back here to the country, whether they find themselves in the competitive environment and whether they get any push for further development, I am talking about that. If they find themselves in the competitive environment, then whatever was invested in them was invested not in vain. And from that we get national, regional and global champions. Then let us summarize. So one of the most important reforms uh, during these seven years via political will, via extrapolation into all the Eurasian economic environment. Yes, yes, I also wanted to say that the current global or regional turbulence will never be over with the global institutions. That's why if we specifically talk about Kazakhstan, I'm not talking about uh, WTO 2.0. We are facing the necessity, if this topic is still will be relevant, then Eurasian or European Union should be restarted in order to make it effective economic union in order not to be a satellite to the union and the new players also are coming and the situation is changing and in order for the benefits of, of all the Eurasian economic union players I think this should become a necessity and so there should be new agreements new rules Look, in all the senses, starting from sanctions against many Russian, not only enterprises, individuals or sectors of economy, which is already a necessity, there is a threat for secondary sanctions and many sectors already got unexpected growth of capitalization that does not bring any benefits to Kazakhstani society or economy. The couldn't be achieved just at the expense of any brokers. And all this is restart for 360 degrees. And it's clear that this is huge, painful, diplomatic work to be done. And then we understand in what model it may be. And then, actually, we already are not a satellite for the Eurasian Economic Union. Mr. Reimbeck, I'd like you to give your opinion related to the priorities in the economic, social and political environment during these seven forthcoming years. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome everybody again. and. This event is very important as far as exchange of views is always useful, and the agenda is uh, very interesting. And as I think, the tasks are quite clear for the minimum 20 years we are facing. One significant issue, all the issues related to the diversification of economy, development of regions. We have a lot of national projects. We have different types of projects with the government, but the challenge is the same, how to implement 
all these projects. And from the perspective of implementation, we specifically suffer starting from the goals and uh, what we need to focus on. First of all, on implementation. And this is aspect number one. Aspect number two, if we structurize, I would uh, split this topic into three issues or three categories. The first would be regions, and in the regions, the several tasks should become relevant. So whatever is related to the small businesses. This is a very sensitive topic which has a lot of professional nuances, a lot of speculation. We hear about this topic and with small and micro businesses are not jurisdiction of any level of the government and there should be the programs of small businesses. The second regional topic would be priority sectors or industries. Each region has its priorities in the industries and uh, the budgets always are limited, resources are limited and we should be focused on priority industries in each region and they are shown in the strategies but there should be done some updating and there are not more than 10 industries in each region. This is related to the regions and in the regions there would be another separate topic related to protection of entrepreneurship and without ecosystem for protecting the businesses, everything that is related to the justice or legal issues, no doubt doesn't work at all and regions would become a separate topic. The second topic relates to the industries that for Kazakhstan are priority, priorities and we need to define that, for example, we have 10 industries that should uh, get some different approach from us and here business to government should be implemented uh, with the government within the framework of the National Chamber of Entrepreneurship and we need to consolidate the expertise, what we lack very strongly. We understand that government authorities and sectoral ministries is just that humus soil that is not very big and in each region it is based on two or three specialists and in the industry irrespective whether it is energy, gas or oil or agrarian sector, trade, tourism or anything else or that industry where we think it is important to consolidate the expertise and to elaborate the p transparent rules for the competitive environment. We need to keep this competition in and competitive environment to reduce the role of the government and the rules should be transparent to raise the investments and we need to make the industries attractive for investors. Not all of them are interesting for investors. And third block, third section, pillar, is the human capital. We can talk about the new wave of business. We can talk about new mindset, uh, new impact projects that uh, are now trend, trendy, but uh, we shall uh, rightly uh, receive it and implement it. Those are the three directions. Uh, among those three directions are horizontal two important uh, areas. Primarily, it's uh, court reforms, court and tax reforms. I think those are two pillars. Without uh, court reforms, so we cannot talk about investment climate uh, and uh, overall about reforms as well. 
court reform is uh, locomotive. Uh, tax reform, we are well aware, in my understanding, tax reform is uh, uh, its uh, ability to foresee things, certainty. It's a certainty of the tax code, as President says, because we need to plan. And the second, which is more important, uh, is administering. If we, again, with the old databases uh, and uh, there is no uh, platform part of the tax code, this will be all very complicated. We can define the regions and sectors and so on, but if administering is um, not right, then we cannot talk about better investment climate. So this would be the areas for thought. Well, uh, I, what I liked is that uh, we didn't have any difficulties with setting objectives and the right wording, but we had difficulties with implementation. You, as a participant of the market and as a representative of the entrepreneurs, uh, tax needs to be clear, it needs to be certain, it needs to be foreseeable, it needs to be a voluntary. This was repeated and we even stated that in written form many times, ten, five years ago. And uh, when you say small and medium business is overlooked, it's again admitting that the reforms uh, didn't succeed fully. Well then, what needs to be changed in the mechanisms of implementation so that this time we do better than last time? Well, we are not on the scratch, we are not uh, on the empty space. From implementation point of view, we, business needs to consolidate and be partners uh, with the state uh, uh, and uh, to give clear mechanisms so uh, what we are short of. Uh, there are no clear mechanisms of control. It's a target indicators and the key indicators. They need to be five, seven, no more than 10. We say we put together, developed strategy together. We set the objectives. Uh, 2024, 2025, 2026 in any sector, in tourism or energy, are clear. But how do we implement them? But this mechanism already exists. Uh, there is a National Chamber of Entrepreneurs, uh, sectoral committees, uh, regional presence, uh, business associations. Uh, well, uh, we are talking about the vertical in the National Chamber, and now we are talking about the uh, system of the state planning. Uh, where are the strategy? Where are the support tools? Uh, they need to be in the system of the state planning. Uh, energy was something we discussed with all of us, development of the energy sector. What is the current sector of those programs? Uh, or with CK, we were discussing agrarian facility. Did they give us uh, jointly with Kairata, we do the dairy business, dairy business. Uh, did it uh, give any impetus and development, uh, those billions, those uh, reforms that we had in our uh, program, did they help? Did they really help? And what mechanisms are wo working and what are not? Uh, this is the key thing. I believe that uh, if these uh, key indicators are defined and the president looks at the sector, the government, uh, the head of the government, uh, the sectoral minister and the mayor looks uh, at the same sector, for example, a dairy sector, what we are familiar with. We realize to develop the farm, you need a plus minus 10,000 USD per cow. That was 10, 20 years ago. The cost of the cow is growing. The rest is fixed the same. To decrease capex, capital expenses, Rahim, we have also discussed uh, we need to develop uh, the breed. Uh, breed uh, cattle, 60, 70 percent of all the capex. So did we succeed? Or when we talk about the grain business, in grain, do we have efficient uh, seeds, agri-technologies, and so on? Those are uncertain things, and in key indicators, uh, we can 
have them and uh, supervise and control them jointly. If I understood you right, you feel the shortage of the key performance indicators in the system of strategic planning. Well, not only that, I mean overall, overall approach that we need to make uh, conclusions and uh, implement new approaches in the development of the state planning and its implementation. And I believe uh, the synergy of business and state uh, and the state private partnership uh, should uh, work uh, completely at a different level. Thank you. Uh, next uh, question is to Mr. Robbins. Probably you understood from our discussion that uh, there are certain unsatisfaction, dissatisfaction with the reforms, with the efficiency of the reform, and this dissatisfaction is in different stratas, different levels uh, in the state level, in the entrepreneurship, and in the society. Uh, from institutional point of view, what can be done? for such countries as Kazakhstan in building more efficient institutes that would allow to succeed better performance, better positions in the targeted goals. I'm going to respond with a little presentation, so if you indulge me. Um, so so uh, the title of the session is Top 7 Reforms in the Next 7 Years. Of course, I don't have a list, I don't have the knowledge of the gentleman here, for example, to talk about specific reforms. But I did want to talk about some of the issues from my, uh, from my perspective and some of my reactions to sort of reading and thinking and being here uh, for the third time in, in, in Kazakhstan. But, but a very different Kazakhstan uh, than when I first came, uh, I have to say. So, what? Okay. Okay, so, so I, think, I think, you know, the target, uh, the target it seems to, there seems to be a lot of agreement about what the target is, what Kazakhstan is trying to do. It's trying to become a prosperous development nation and it's trying to build inclusive institutions. I think the starting point of that in 1990 was very, very difficult. In 1990, you had extractive institutions in every dimension, in the political sphere, in the economic sphere. And since then, Kazakhstan has been building more inclusive institutions. But, but what I hear is that it's made much more progress in some dimensions than others. And in particular, with respect to the state and the functionality of the state, there are many challenges. The gentleman who spoke before me talked a lot about implementation and the problem of implementation. That, for me, is a problem of the capacity of the state, of the institutions of the state. And part of the problem, as I understand it, is after the transition from, from the Soviet Union, the state which emerged in Kazakhstan was highly personalized uh, and it would, you know, was very patrimonial, you could say. Okay? It was very personalized. And so now, that's the antithesis of institutionalization, okay? Having a state, a personalized state, is the opposite of what you need to build institutions. But there's a lot of progress. Things are improving. You know, this is, you know, sometimes symbolic things transfer or tell you a lot about a society. So I was very impressed at Astana is Astana again now. That's part of this process of depersonalization, it seems to me, of politics in Kazakhstan. And that's exactly what needs to happen. Okay? But here's the problem. In strategy Kazakhstan 2050, it says the main goal, our main goal, the main goal of the country is to enter the club of top 30 most developed countries in the world. Okay? But I think there's a lot of recognition here you can't do that with, when your institutions are the 60th ranked, okay? So, so the current assessment of institutions, I don't want to go into this picture in detail, this is just from the World Economic Forum, I'm sure many of you know this, is that the institutional quality in Kazakhstan is 60th in the world, not 30th, okay? So if you want to go from where you are to being one of the 30th richest countries in the world, you need to improve the quality of institutions, and that's what there's a lot of discussion about. Okay, so, so what to focus on? You know, I think what we know from economic history and what we talk about in our book is 
There's no experience of successful economic development ever without a dynamic, vibrant private sector. Okay? That was how the British Industrial Revolution worked. It was how the United States became the richest country in the world. It's how China has worked. It's how South Korea has worked, allowing the private sector to flourish. So then the question is, how can the government create institutions which are synergetic with that, which will help that sector to flourish? And rather than talk about sort of specific policies, I could talk about, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that perhaps you have to think about. I think what I would emphasize a lot is something that came up this morning, which is the need for administrative reforms. If you have a state which is highly personalized, you need administrative forms. You need to kind of try to implement the procedures which are going to allow you to use policy properly. And you need prioritization, seven reforms, that's about prioritization. But I think you also need, and this comes back to what we were talking before this morning, if you look at successful development experiences, kind of vision and goals. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is strategy. So just let me give you some examples of administrative reforms. One of my favorite, so this looks very mysterious. But in England, in our book, we talk about the transition towards more inclusive institutions, which happens towards the end of the 17th century in England. And one of the things that happened was administrative reform. And for the first time in English history, they created a meritocratic bureaucracy to collect excise taxes. So this is the, this is a sort of, you know, this is the rounds of Supervisor Cowperthwaite. That's a very good uh, Saxon name. Supervisor Cowperthwaite was a meritocratically recruited uh, excise tax collector, and this is where he went in Yorkshire in, uh, 17, uh, in, uh, in 1710, looking at excise taxes were taxes levied on production of consumption items, beer, bread. He went around monitoring the producers, seeing how much they produce, seeing how much tax they should pay. And a very elaborate system of checks and balances and authority was created to make sure there wasn't corruption, that the taxes were collected, and, and, and that was what the government used to start investing in infrastructure and public goods to lay the basis for the Industrial Revolution. So this was administrative reform. We know a lot about how to do administrative reform. We know a lot about what works in, uh, in terms of incentives and, and, and so, but, but you have to do it if you want to make a transition away from a patrimonial state. If you want to have implementation, you need to have bureaucracy and you need to have administrative reform. Uh, one of my favorite, uh, I've been studying recently a lot South Korean industrialization, uh, you know, you need prioritization. Here's a man who understood prioritization. At the far end of the table is General Park. And here he's presiding, he's chaired, he used to chair every month the export promotion meeting. So every month there would be an export promotion meeting. General Park would bring the heads of the chai bowl together and they'd talk about the problems. What are the problems? What can you do? What can't you do? What do you need? What should we prioritize? It was a way of gathering information, aggregating information, but General Park really paid attention to this. Okay? You can't pay attention to a hundred things. You can pay attention to a few things. But General Park really paid attention to this. So, and he set goals, he set targets, and here he is in 1977 at $10 billion US exports. So he says, he set a target, we're going to export $10 billion. Okay? And here he is handing out prizes in 1977 to the CEOs of companies who managed to export and achieve this target. So, so we were talking about this this morning, this idea of where are we going, how are we going to get there. You don't know, there's going to be lots of problems, there's going to be lots of challenges, that's what the export promotion meeting was about, but economic development was prioritized. The role of the state in helping the private sector was prioritized. The president was on the case, and you know, this is what they call a developmental state, and it went along with bureaucratization. When General Park came to power, he created a new ministry that was designed to focus on promoting economic development and trying to figure out what the private sector needed and how it would uh, go. Okay? So, so, visions and goals. General Park was very good at that. And my story is not about the military. You know, if you've read my book, you know, you know, 
It's not about the military. There's no reason why democratic presidents can't do this. This is just about the strategy. It's not about the military. I don't think that has anything to do with it, actually. General Park was just a man who wanted to develop his country, like Lee Kuan Yew, like many other people. Okay? So, and I would say the last thing, strategy, uh, which is, you know, there may be many things you want to do, but you can't do them because powerful people won't let you do them or because you don't have the administrative capacity in some dimensions to do it, or it's too difficult to accumulate it. So strategy isn't just about economics, it's also about politics and about building coalitions. And I think every successful re reform experience you see is sensitive to the political economy. Okay? So, so reform is not just a technical issue, it's also a deeply political issue. People feel threatened by change, by institutional change. It destroys power relations and it, it, it destroys the status quo in many ways. So the political challenges are probably more important than the technical challenges. We all know how to do administrative reform or create bureaucracy. The challenge to doing it is not technical, it's actually political. Okay? So, so, so I don't want to, there are many, nevertheless, <laughs> there are many examples of successful strategies to deal with some of the political difficulties of reform. So I have lots of, inf I'm, not, I'm just going to give you a couple of obvious examples. I, I have many things to say about this, but I don't have time to say them. So I just want to state the problem, okay? One of the most remarkable things about the experience of Chinese reform since the 1970s is the very sophisticated way that they dealt with political challenges. When Deng Xiaoping started doing reform, there was no consensus whatsoever within the Communist Party that reform was needed. In fact, at the time of the Tiananmen Square uprising, everything almost went into reverse. It was only Deng Xiaoping's political skills that kept it going. Okay? So he endlessly had to deal with political challenges to the reforms in China. Okay? So, so how do you you know, just let me give you a couple of examples. I could, I could talk about this for hours because I find it a fascinating topic. Okay? So, obvious one, which is there's always losers. All right? so, so, here's a, let me, go, let me go back to my excise tax example. When the British government created a bureaucratic tax administration, who was threatened by that? Rich people were. Rich people in England didn't want to pay taxes. Who were the main rich people in England at the time? Big landowners. Okay, big landowners are very politically powerful. They were often elites, aristocrats. They were in House of Commons, House of Lords. So they could have stopped the government creating an administration, an efficient administration. So what did the government do? Well, they taxed consumption. They taxed excise taxes. Now, an economist would tell you that's a terrible thing to tax. It's regressive. You know, you shouldn't levy regressive taxations. You should be taxing rich people. Okay? What should you have done? Tax land. That's not what they did. In fact, the British government bureaucratized the excise tax system, which primarily fell on relatively poor people, bread, beer, etc. But they never bureaucratized the land tax, which fell on rich people. And in fact, you can see from this graph, I don't know if you can see, but I can tell you what it says. The land tax revenue withered away, and the state was funded by excise taxes. That's not something any economist would tell you but to do, but that was what was politically feasible in England in the early 18th century. Okay? So that allowed reforms to happen, it got resources for the state, it provided public goods, it allowed things to move ahead. The Chinese were also experts at this. Okay? When you look at the transition in the industrial sector that takes place, this is, just, this is from Ying Yi Qian, who's a great Chinese scholar of the reform, uh, between 1978 and 1988, what you see is that state employment stays the same. So state-owned industries in China were terribly threatened by private sector dynamism. What did the government do? You can see state employment even goes up over that period. Okay? So, so here you see... Ah! Okay. All right, I won't do, but it's on the same line. State employment stays the same. You see, the state sector was not threatened. People's jobs weren't threatened. The rents accruing to people working in the state sector were not threatened. But non-state employees, private employment explodes. 
Okay. So the state sector was left alone. They weren't threatened with radical privatization or disruption or their livelihoods were not threatened, their jobs were not threatened. They were left alone. They were, it was structured so they could live with the reforms. But on the, on the margin, the private sector exploded. There's many, many examples of this in the Chinese experience. So you have to think through who's going to lose, who's going to oppose, and you have to structure reform in a way that makes them content with those changes. Okay? Every, every successful reform is like that. Here, I call this, is, why did I call this strategy number eight? Because I have lots of them. Okay, here's my strategy number nine, and this comes back to what I was talking about uh, this morning, or we were discussing this morning, which is, I think it's very good to have something to dream about, you know? Like, dreaming and ambition are good. This is, uh, this is a curious example, maybe. This is Lagos in Nigeria. So I work a lot in Africa. Lagos is a very interesting place. It's a place where there's been enormous improvement in public goods, in investment in the city, um, uh, and you see on the left in 2012 there was this empty beach and now on the right there's what's called Echo. Echo is the, the local Yoruba name for uh, Lagos. The city is called Echo in Yoruba. Echo Atlantic City. They're going to build a Dubai, an African Dubai in Lagos. Okay? So very ambitious but they want to dream and I think it's ambition and dreaming are good. You know, creating an image of where you're going to be in the future, where Kazakhstan can be in the future. That's something that can get people working together, cooperating, and, and you know, a bit of utopianism is a, is a very good thing, I think. Okay, so, so, so I, you know, why nations fail is, you know, the point of why nations fail is societies are not condemned to poverty by culture or geography, okay? Societies are poor because of the decisions and choices of self-interested self people that may not coincide with what's in the collective welfare. But that's good because it means you can choose a different future. The future is different from the past and Kazakhs, people in Kazakhstan can choose a different and more prosperous and inclusive uh, institution a, 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 a more prosperous and inclusive future. There's lots of details to work out, okay? There's lots of details to work out. But I think the important thing is just to recognize the need for building, building institutions, thinking ahead, setting goals, prioritizing, sequencing, prioritizing are very important. So I don't have seven policies to, to talk about. But I congratulate the organizers on recognizing, he said seven may be too many, <laughs> that you can only prioritize a very few things. If you read about President Park, President Park, really, that's one thing he really understood. And, and, uh, and so that's critical in all these re reform experiences too. So that's, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. I'd like to ask you one more question. I think you gave a good remark and your recommendations are very relevant for Kazakhstan from the perspective of strategi strategies, goals, targets and visions and uh, necessity to build coalitions in reforms implementations. And as I think your successful cases and recipes remind us the recipes of new liberalism and the people in power always made such coalitions with big businesses and in your opinion what kind of coalitions we need to make and as for the phenomenon coalitions with big businesses with private uh, sector is usually huge growth of inequality which may also finish with state capture when corporations influence very much on corporate governance and uh, simple people do not have other opportunities that they could have if the situation would be different. You know, I think what stopped inequality emerging in the Korean case, for example, was enormous investment in education. So that, that's common to many of these East Asian cases. So enormous investment in education. So I, I think that, you know, so that then the, what stopped what stopped business, you know, capturing the state? I think that's about building institutions. You know, I think the state has to be sufficiently strong, you know, and there has to be sufficient political will, if you like, 
to force business to, you know, to create incentives. So what they did in Korea was to create incentives. You know, General Park created incentives to export. If you export, you get subsidized credit, you know, you get access to, you know, all sorts of, you know, you get access to, to, to licenses to import technology. And so they created incentives and the state was sufficiently capable to, to enforce those incentives. So if you didn't perform, you lost your subsidized credit. You know. so, so I think that is about, it's about both the, the politics, it's about the political will to really focus on developing Kazakhstan and pushing towards these goals and just wanting to make that happen, uh, you know, which is about politics. I mean, it's about informing people and getting people to realize that's where the country's going. So then the people put pressure on you to deliver. That's what happens in a democracy. Uh, and, you know, I think, I think that, that's, that's the recipe to try to avoid state capture. You know, there's always elements of state capture and, you know, and, and, and rent seeking or whatever it is. Um, but, but I also think, you know, it's a sort of change in mentality. You know, I think if you went back to the 1950s, and this is what's interesting in Korea, if you went back to the 1950s in Korea, you'd see that when Syngman Rhee was president, there was a lot of rent seeking and monopolies and state capture. But that was reversed, you know, it was reversed uh, in the part period. And I think that's, you know, that's a change in the mentality. But I think what, what I find interesting about the Kazakhstan case is that, you know, businessmen here already have a very globalized mentality. You know, they think about the world as their market or the potential is the world. You know, you're not going to make much money in Kazakhstan selling stuff to 18 million people. You know, if you can sell stuff to 180 million people, you know, or 1.8 billion people, then you can really be successful as a business person. And that's, that's what business people want to do. And General Park made that. He made it also a thing about status. You know, it's, it's a, there's a lot to talk about there in terms of how that worked, you know, uh, about the status in society. That's what a lot of those meetings were about. So I think there's many, I understand that problem, <laughs> and it could happen. Uh, nothing is for sure, but I think there's ways of trying to anticipate it. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Experience of Korea, South Korea is uh, enormously interesting. And all the reforms that took place in South Korea, they, in a parallel way, built the uh, government institutions. And a lot of politicians were accused for corruption, killed, and etc. What is the other side of the Korean success in terms of political reforms and political institutions appearance, it also should be studied very well, not only clear success and etc. Mr. Serik, I'd like you to talk about seven prioritized reforms. It would be better uh, for you to emerge us into several turning points you may see or dilemmas that could be in the track of Kazakhstan or any conflict of interest between different agencies or serious budget limits or difficulties in choosing priorities and etc. Thank you very much. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to express appreciation to Oljas and his team, a wonderful gathering of speakers and uh, participants of the forum, which makes it very interesting. And I don't know what I would be talking about, whether could sound, could sound like uh, reforms prioritization, but I'd like to talk about some certain activities and some certain movement that already were defined and what Mr. Robinson was talking about experience of South Korea maybe at that time it was easier to work there was no legislation like um, uh, great pressure on WTO accession to s camps between the US and China and etc. And now conditions are quite different. They are much tougher now. But in general, everything depends on the will in which direction you are willing to move. And the day before yesterday or last week, Rainbow and I were talking in which direction we should move, but this movement is inevitable in any case. And 
we talked about the directions for external trade and in trade policy, you may see other trends. And the trends that define our reforms and our movement, first of all, include deglobalization as it is and the structure of the global economy were defined by two huge axes. First, relations between China and the U.S., so-called Chimerica. Before that, it was cheap products from China, investments from the U.S. After 2016, the technological racing starts and some certain economic wars. And the second axis was called Eurasia, Eurasia, cheap minerals from Russia in exchange for products from Europe. These two axes now do not work now. And we have the results of that. Moreover, the new axis appears, this may call Chi, Russia, or Ru, India. Different names could be given to such axes. But the essence is, and I talk to my colleagues, many of them say that in huge international organizations, it's very difficult to find common language and pairs work better when there are some regional interests and opportunity to work in joint efforts. And that's why the interesting trend is shown that is based on protectionism by all the states. And protectionism may be healthy and unhealthy. And it's hard to work in such conditions. Apart to this, there is energy crisis as well as food crisis. In this regard, we have to choose such a reform, reform number one, which should take place in agriculture, certainly. And approaches and what we discussed, like issues related to milk, we need just to put in order statistics. We need to recognize that we have a lack of dairy products and to define some quantity needed for the domestic supply and guarantee the sustainability of subsidies into the agriculture. Together with that, to build some re behavioral conditions. And as General Park did when he appointed in South Korea some certain champions, which would be farms with forage base to develop the uh, dairy and um, meat livestock. We will allocate the cheap money in order to grow up the animal population or the cattle population as fast as possible manufacturing of red meat as well as uh, chicken uh, could uh, be a reform which uh, presumes the allocations from the budget in terms of subsidies into the agriculture with the conditions of so-called external squeezing when we uh, grow the inflation, which is the security to the government, to the state. Agronomy, keeping agronomic indicators by all the farms as the behavioral condition for getting the government support as far as it is not kept. And not long ago, I was in Gos Agro and Ainerbek Kosnazarov said the following interesting thing, that subsidy is just a device for walking to a human and uh, until some certain period of time, this may be a pair of crutches only up to the development of the enterprise or keeping this enterprise uh, unhealthy and use of capacity of internal rivers. And we are talking about northern rivers, Irtish, Ishim, that uh, also includes another third factor, weather, weather which we cannot impact on with other equal conditions 
when we keep these factors, then the order may beat the calculations or com computations. As I already said, what will it bring to? I will talk on the problems related to logistics and change of logistics. Logistics in supplies will inevitably cause consideration of re consideration of industries and now grain becomes the zone of tough competition. In order to trade the grain, we also need some further processing industry, processing of grain and the huge sectoral programs that are very hardly monitored and that are supported with indicators should be replaced by the sectoral regional plans that could be monitored very easily, but they could be included into a national sectoral program. Such kind of reform will be implemented in agriculture. The next industry is trade, and from the researches, we need to say that trade is 18.7 percent from a GDP, and uh, actually it is 16 percent, but given the uh, transport expenses as well as warehousing and etc., and 18.17 uh, percent could be a huge figure, and 60 percent of the population in the earth is older than 60 years old. And what do these people do? They save money. They consume food and drinks of some different quality. They are indifferent in vehicles and machines. They rent the apartments. 85% of their shopping is done online, 40% via their smartphones. And what we may have in the future? In the future, the trade will be shifting into the digital format and traditional shops or stores we are used to the, will be transformed into the warehouse, into the fulfillment center. And with that, we are going to invest in the modern format of trade. Why? Because we don't have other options. The formats of categories B, C, and uh, very uh, sophisticatedly managed and we are going to support them and in this regard the government policy with the trends that are today in place will be in some way uh, transformed and uh, there should be some balance in that. Although my consultants are used to say that average person makes four shoppings um, a week, two near his house and two in the big formats. And what will be his shopping habits tomorrow? Whether he will leave his housing for shopping or not, or there will be a walk uh, in the family around uh, into the cinema and etc. And no shopping uh, in the traditional way. And that's why trade as one of the sectoral um, services uh, now come to 18.7 percent and we cannot lose this ratio. It should be either grow or should not be lost at all. And the third, what I am going to say, would be reconsideration our attitude to logistics, both transit and uh, internal. And we say Western Europe, Western China. We may simply say West and East. And West and East for us is a transit corridor. We make money on transit transportation. Now, given the fact what is happening in the world, all eyes are on uh, North south uh, route. 
the change of the corridor or the route will bring to the change of the paradigm of the production. If west-east corridor was the battle for the quality uh, for American and uh, European markets in north-south uh, will be quantity, quantity, because the markets are developing countries. Uh, but it will be harsh uh, competitiveness, and we are already experiencing that uh, harsh competition. We will have to diversify markets, uh, diversify export. As a result, we will go to deeper processing, deeper processing that will uh, allow us to cope with the road. Recently, we visited Iran and uh, met different uh, shipping companies, and they said, uh, your uh, product is uh, very interesting for Nairobi, but you cannot bring to Nairobi the grain with this price. You can take flour, you can take the spaghetti uh, and uh, Rudni city, uh, uh, which produces the iron ore, the investment uh, return is uh, 1,000, 1,500 kilometers. And uh, this iron uh, ore was for the magnet uh, to bring it uh, uh, just for several hundreds of kilometers. And now the whole city depends on it. What do they need to do? They need to diversify. They need to go deeper into the processing. And this requires capital. And those are the reforms. In this regards, the deeper processing in all fields, which we have always been talking, becomes very necessary because we'll have to do that because when you are forced, then you do. Not because you do that or willing or unwilling. That's why the many of the reforms that we are discussing with the colleagues, uh, they, are, uh, they are forced, forced reforms. Next reform that we are going to have is the reform in the energy sector. We need primarily why are they called in the energy sector? We need to define the sources, uh, sources of the raw material. We don't have so many options. In fact, uh, unlikely uh, the proficiency uh, will be created on this market uh, on account of the gas, but gas uh, has its own challenges, and then we won't be able to use it for certain projects for diversification, petrochemicals, petrogas chemicals, just chemicals, and so on. Therefore, gas is required for other purposes, and uh, there are certain difficulties. Coal. Coal undoubtedly will stay as a raw material in spite of the fact about the green energy and so on and so forth so for certain um, consumption, non-industrial consumption, coal will still be used. And of course, uranium, it's a promising source because we have it in a limitless amount. And uh, there are other factors uh, which are factors of the citizens, uh, uh, working with the citizens, raising awareness, uh, renewable sources of energy, good uh, sources of energy. If it's a hydro energy, if uh, there are other sources, uh, then development of the regulatory capacity and the regulatory capacity is something that we need. Uh, instability and the fluctuating energy of Kazakhstan is uh, because of this uh, sources. Then important reforms are in education. Education as a reform is uh, uh, long awaited. We are making the project called Comfortable Schools. We are investing big amounts, building the schools of new generation. But again, the quality of the faculty and teachers, where do we take so many teachers from? The question is, where would it bring in the future? In the senior grades, they'll have to be some majors a level, A level that we have, uh, that is when school students have to choose their major, uh, and then the demand uh, in the same uh, quality of all subjects and disciplines will disappear. The shortage of staff 
will also lead to. We are now developing uh, dual programs with foreign universities. Uh, five leading foreign universities will be coming to Kazakhstan. Three uh, have come, uh, Mifi, Gupkin, and Arizona University. Few more are on way and consider it, but it will not address the problem of all universities. Uh, of course, the number of the students will be restricted and limited as well. In the future, we'll have to move in the direction of recognizing the right of the young people, and not only young people, to receive education online. Confirm it then. Uh, the results uh, and the outcomes of this education so that they can uh, can be part of this intellectual community, scientific or professional. This is such a big reform. And at last, since I am now involved in the sociology, socio social subject, uh, the public administration and the state support reforms. What we are doing now in the state support is the reform is called a social wallet social wallet is um, the f uh, future development of the service state uh, the amount of the social support is quite big uh, we can call our state social state we aim at that it's not bad uh, but uh, tomorrow it will um, stop certain development programs. Uh, therefore, it's quite fair, and it was mentioned many times, that we need to support those who really need the support. Uh, the social support needs to be targeted. In the future, the future development of this uh, thesis uh, will inevitably bring to that this uh, area uh, will be for optimization. The state will optimize the schemes based on big data, data-driven government. We can talk about it. They will use elements of the feedback loop. They will study it. And now we are already starting this uh, uh, proactive uh, delivery of the governmental services. We now look at few cases. Uh, enterprise shutdown. Uh, the head of the family lost his job. A similar enterprise or plant is in the nearing uh, city, 60 kilometers away, or it's absent. And then the state should give a voucher for the movement, for commuting. And uh, if it not existing, uh, then he needs to upgrade his qualification because he needs uh, this support right now, right here. The family uh, broken, they get divorced, husband lost, loses job. Uh, what woman needs? A woman needs kindergarten, support from the state uh, for the pregnancy period or for uh, while the husband is still looking for the job. The system of the state administration, public administration, will change. What is happening in the country now is a listening state, the state that hears the voice of the people. It's what Mr. Robinson was talking about, elements of the inclusive development, which is already working since the beginning of the year. We are witnessing its vivid development, uh, but digital technologies uh, need to serve the budget first uh, so that uh, we have order. Mr. Sirik Makanovic, thank you very much. A short question and short answer, please. Uh, overall, you agree that macroeconomic external conditions are very favorable. We have record export and uh, most likely will have trade proficiency. National Fund has big aims, 100 billion and so on. And there is a lot of uh, uh, Mr. Rubini is quoted by all just that there will be a big global crisis and a recession. Is there plan B or C in case if oil prices fall and uh, the reforms are of course uh, relevant but uh, will they be able to uh, carry the name of anti-crisis? Uh, well, I don't want to retell now uh, PCA. 
uh, with the oil price, uh, there will be scenarios, but the reform still will be. You think uh, the state has plan, plan B and plan C, it has optimal plan, super optimal plan, and the uh, not so optimal plan, which we call the option C. Uh, of course, it mainly depends on the uh, price of the raw material on world markets. Uh, but what I said, what is happening in external markets will change the paradigm itself. Uh, those plans will be for some time with us, but uh, uh, by 2025, uh, uh, the amount of process uh, exports should be 41 billion tinge. It's, uh, it's a non-raw export. Uh, we are not talking about raw, uh, non-raw exports. The processed, uh, processed export should be 41 billion tinge, and that is completely different plan, completely different targets. If uh, we do in our scenarios, if we will be looking at the midterm period, uh, we will be in the uh, vulnerable position. Thank you. Next uh, speaker, Ashat Uzbekov, uh, the chairman of the KSL. Ashat, please give very short your vision on priorities in reforms uh, and uh, uh, how you should come out of your sectoral specificity. A very interesting format of the forum, very interactive. I'm happy to be among you. I try. Uh, on behalf of the sector, and uh, I'll probably also include something from myself uh, in one interesting book. It is said that maturity, that the uh, state success is the balance uh, between the strong power and the mature society. Instead of uh, those two ends, I would call it uh, uh, I would change into triangle. This is my personal position. I would call the personality of every person. Why the sector we are working in, the colleagues, it's a client-centered, just like a majority of the non-raw sectors of economy. It's a client-oriented, customer-oriented. The person is in the center. And if in the current triangle, the state dominates over the state and the individual, I think, as a result of not only those reforms, but overall the changes in our life, uh, we need to be customer-oriented and uh, human-oriented. If in uh, usual life a person has uh, a right, he doesn't like uh, communication, he, he comes from competitors to us, in the case with the state, they need to be high level of involvement of the person, individual, and the state into the joint success, and not only to waver uh, and refusing living in our country, but do his best so that living in our country is um, at most comfortable, not from resource consumption and the supply uh, point of view, but uh, the contribution and the making additional value economic added uh, for yourself and for the society and for the state. This is my personal point of view. As for the communication, of course, uh, we don't have uh, 7G. We have 5G on the agenda. We understand that, uh, uh, again, if go back not to the triangle but to the pyramid in the pyramid of the Maslow, uh, the main thing is Wi-Fi, and we understand that uh, now communication is so unnoticeable but integral part of life uh, that uh, we uh, all colleagues uh, and the three mobile operators uh, and the fixed operators, we all see big discrepancy between demands of our subscribers and what we can offer and we are in the new in new investment stage officially it will be under the umbrella of the 5G but i want to say 5G is a very good product but meanwhile making reference uh, to 
seven, eight years ago when 4G appeared, nobody knew how to use it and there were a lot of supporters that uh, 3G is enough, we have WhatsApp, we can watch the video and now people don't imagine their life without smartphones and without applications, uh, without banks, uh, without uh, shopping. I'm sure 5G will be and should be the database for the new leap. And now in the world, uh, we don't have a mass cases of using 5G B2C business to customer. It's mainly pr private 5G, some solutions uh, that are tailor-made. I'm sure that in the nearest uh, few years there will be technological leap and uh, all the demands of 5G will be met uh, and our customers, our consumers, our citizens will be using the advantages and we on our hand uh, will try to make the needs of customers and our opportunities uh, uh, to come into one line and not to mismatch. Thank you. I think some may say before going to 5G, let's not forget 4G and fix it so that it works properly. Uh, I understood that I was uh, invited to be criticized and I am ready to be scolded. Well, I am not lonely in my statement. Uh, not always 4G works stably in Kazakhstan. Well, uh, the short, uh, f fast fact, uh, all um, pilot operators made, uh, uh, mobile operators made pilots in Turkestan region in December of last year. Uh, seven times uh, increase the consum consumption of traffic in the city of Turkestan and the share of smartphones. Uh, people who are over 80 times of times uh, is uh, all traffic is taken by the newcomers and when full scale 5G comes, the level of consumption will have to uh, grow in exponent exponentially in ten tenfold uh, we made business cases and uh, i'm saying as a representative of the representative we do our best we are making optimistic scenarios on consumption of the traffic and i hope this time it all will be better thank you thank you very much uh, now we have some uh, picture uh, about the development uh, of uh, competition, small and medium business, dairy business, 5G. And our speaker, Oljas uh, Tuleov, uh, represents this, uh, Tuleov, uh, Tuleov, uh, Tuleov, uh, Tuleov, Oljas, uh, the strategic um, agency representative. Uh, Aspir, uh, Oljas, you remember that was institutional step uh, to respond to the overall dissatisfaction how we perform the reforms that were announced. And there were hopes that this institution that is not part of the government will play the role where expertise will be accumulated and uh, the government will be uh, consulting and getting the right indicators uh, the, and Bureau of National Statistics. Uh, ASPIR, uh, your organization uh, has been existing for a year or two in President uh, in 2019 assigned to develop the new economic policy and the agency made several attempts to develop it as I understand. Uh, uh, given the fact uh, there is a new political cycle, just please tell your personal opinion. What do we enter with with the prioritization of reforms, uh, current state of the public administration? Because most likely this audience is also aware that they were uh, wars. Uh, Rahim Sakenovich, uh, thank you very much. First of all, I would like uh, to thank uh, CSI and Mr. Oljas Kudaybergenev for uh, forum and for invitation. Uh, Asit Armanovich Aigaliev, the chairman, was supposed to speak, but he was on a business trip. That's why I was honored to replace him and to give the conceptual um, 
understanding of what is uh, what we are doing before answering the question probably there should be some two uh, made into the history and to give definition to the word reform we are discussing it and this is the key topic of our uh, session and uh, it is strange but uh, from latin reform is revival or return of what it existed before and this is given by the french academy of the 18th century to revive what already existed before and in this perspective the reform up to the new time uh, showed that the European community was traditional and uh, valued the uh, the achievements and whatever new appeared certainly was resisted and they explained it that uh, what uh, is uh, with them now is much much better than risks of doing something new and uh, Hoffman Hayek uh, described it in his book and the modern understanding of the word reform which is reorganizations for improvements was formed at the end of 1980s when practically the collapse of uh, two polar world happened the collapse of the soviet union and acute crisis of the left populism in the Latin America and then in one of the conferences in the US economist John Williamson uh, presented his report that was named what Washington understands under reforms or what means for Washington the reform of policies and he gave a recipe of 10 points that first of all was um, aimed at the countries of the Latin America and then recipe was added by the Congress of the US the International Monetary Fund and now it is named Washington uh, yeah, yeah, yeah if you can speak uh, uh, briefer then we would appreciate it uh, in compliance with the time limit I will be able to uh, deliver my thought and this new concept was adopted by Kazakhstan as well and practically all 30 years of our independence we were very obedient learners and tried to comply with the recommendations of the International Monetary Fund and other financial international organizations and in the first stages such reforms were fruitful like liberalization of prices new tax code and other other documents and uh, uh, there was the growth of well-being and uh, GDP also was growing at the end of 1990s but recently we started to understand that uh, the uh, application of these principles uh, do not allow us to achieve our goals and uh, the also John Williamson started to criticize his notion that he was misunderstood and misinterpreted and the uh, coming back why it didn't work we may then answer why we should reform ourselves and the peculiarities related to the political and legal basis should be taken into a consensus a Washington consensus is relevant for Kazakhstan now we are talking about reforms for the nearest seven years I will continue and then you will understand now if we are talking why the previous years uh, were failure we didn't achieve what we wanted to achieve because we put the economic issues in the top of our priorities and by that we didn't change the political uh, system and uh, now this year it's well known from the message of our president on 16th of March that reforms will take place in political area now the pyramid started to show its shape and there is good 
uh, example of uh, Estonia after collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the Estonia uh, followed all the recommendations of the International Monetary Fund and formed the political basis after that, the legal layer, and only then to deal with the reforms in the economy. And we, during all 30 years, started from the top of the pyramid, changed the economy. And it was always the main uh, concept that economy first, policy last, and uh, well, which was not right. And if we started our political modernization, after that there will be legal modernization as well as the balance in the economy. And since September this year, the head of the state talking within the framework of his message announced about reforms that were formed together with the administration of the president and other government authorities and in his message he says about the reform in justice, in the quality of selecting the judges, and the equality of judges, uh, starting from the chairman, and increasing the institutionality and quality of the uh, Supreme Judge Council. And answering your question about prioritization, I would say that, first of all, there should be legal reform going first, because it can ensure the uh, rule of law, and second, it will be competitiveness issues, favoritism, as well as the globalization is in the agenda, and the reform related to countering favoritism and increasing competition. And the third block of issues would increase the economic freedom issues. And we here will pay attention to the middle businesses and uh, SME now is 50% and middle business has uh, four to six percent, which is explained by the current tax policy to motivate these companies to uh, split down into minor units and uh, pay more attention to smaller businesses. And this will be also budget as well as tax reforms. And new budget code is related to decentralization of inter budgetary relations, increase of uh, regions' independence, as well as important aspect related to the new format of transparency in relations between government and businesses. And certainly it should be sustainable. And we look at that via prism of new procurement law. And if we talk about the reforms that should be perceived by the population, certainly this will be reforms on pricing and the targeted social assistance and utilization in uh, educational system like parents could define what school their children could go to. What about the document named New Economic Policy that uh, was failed to be drafted? And second, uh, what is the quantity of uh, uh, complaints about the statistics reliability and the key devices, economic indicators are broken. And we don't know what is the level of unemployment. It is always 5%. We don't know what is the business acti activities. We don't know what is the well-being of the population and the level of uh, loans borrowed by the individuals. In this regard, whether any reform is planned, not just going back to the past, but education for the statistics. We communicate for a long time and your questions were predefined by me. 
I expected you to ask these questions. As for all these policies, we need to be clear. There was an assignment given by the President to the government that the new economic cause should be formed. It was on the 11th January this year. After that, this work was also done by ASPIR. We need to submit our format. We did this work and I myself presented the conceptual vision of this document in Facebook as well as in the Public Council and in other organizations. It was in May, April. After that the document was submitted to the government and government elaborated it. That's why our engagement was participation of some consulting Way. And the document changed. It was, it didn't look like the document we presented. And now, NAP, as we name it, new economic policy, is under drafting of the Minister of National Economy. You don't have any direct relation to it. Yeah, direct no. And second question from you. statistical agency was taken out of the agency of the government which is the first step for ensuring independence as far as there was huge conflict of interest the second question relates to the quality of statistics it was raised not only in Kazakhstan but also in the developed countries and that's why we may say that reliability or authenticity of statistics, the methodology to form the statistics as far as there are very many sections in statistics, they all are in compliance with the international standards. They also are in compliance with the understanding by UN, IMF and other international organizations. If we talk about the reliability, what you are talking very often about, level of unemployment, for example, yes, official level of uh, unemployment comes to 5%, but this indicator is formed because of the additional calculations, not because of the, no, 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 the question is whether there will be reform or no reform. I will finish. I will finish. No, 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 no. Don't talk about employment. You just gave this example yourself, and that's why I think it's important to talk about that. As for the reforms, there are three types of reforms, and any person may apply for meeting and our chairman may in Zoom or other format talk about that three areas of reforms. The digitalization of statistics first. Second is collection of administrative statistics, departmental statistics, and the third relates to HR. And more details may be given by Mr. Jean Dos if anybody is willing to talk about that with him. And all these approaches were submitted to and supported by the administration of the president. And in the nearest future, you will see the results from these reports. Thank you very much, Oljas. I think that our discussion was very useful. Friends, before giving the floor to Oljas, I'd like organizers to show in the screen QR code for you to scan it and uh, by link answer our questions and make our understanding fuller how the audience sees this situation. Okay, Oljas, let us finish this panel uh, discussions with your vision related to seven reforms. And as the President was saying that the next seven years will be remembered as seven years of cardinal reforms and priorities I see in the following way. Maybe the first uh, direction will be in the political sphere like elections of governors in the regions and the structure of the government will be reformed and the second area is administrative reform and the point is that the government is full of internal limitations and cannot be operational and the internal reform needs for the government to be fast and the third reform relates to the justice it was already said and probably we may dispute here that the justice reform should 
become reform number one. The next reform will be in the uh, law enforcement bodies, in the Ministry of Defense, and a separate reform should be in the social um, sector. Reform number six will be sectoral reform that in different industries like energy sector, a lot of things are obsolete, agriculture, industry, etc. In each industry who works and it knows about the problems there. And the next reform will relate to the activities of the government, strategical planning, budget planning in the government that will allow the state to make visions of the future and achieve these visions. These are the seven areas where reforms are needed. Let us applaud to our speakers to express our appreciation. I hope that you got some new knowledge, some new emotions. By that we think the session is over.